Yeah, hi all. Um, uh, I work within Azure Core uh, for the Azure Managed Luster file system. Um, I've talked about HSM related things in the past and the, uh, the interaction between HSM within a cloud context um, versus what you know normal on-prem Luster systems are using HSM for. I decided to break form this year and talk a little bit about um, another case where uh, the on-prem uh, visualization of metrics, uh, log analysis, things like that, uh, somewhat are different. Uh, this is mostly a scale rather than a use case, um, but nevertheless, um, uh, be focusing on how do we manage uh, Luster within um, a system that doesn't just have, you know, a half dozen or a dozen Luster clusters, but um, many thousand Luster clusters. So today's talk is basically going to be about um, our deep need for that logging metric, logging metrics and alerting. Um, how we handle that within AMLFS, um, making sense of logs when you have thousands of nodes uh, within uh, across like numerous clusters, um, how we collect all those logs, get them off box, especially since some of these clusters are transient. And in some cases we're asked for RC after the cluster is gone, which is especially uh, odd case compared to on-prem. I'll talk about some metrics that we collect um, and then finally uh, alerting so that we can catch problems before uh, we get a call about them. The most vital thing to me about this is making this useful. I'll be presenting a bunch of interfaces that are within Microsoft Azure. And while they are available to anyone that's building products within Microsoft Azure or generally using it, this isn't uh, any internal interfaces. Um, I would love to make this more generally useful and trade notes um, in the question session or afterwards with anybody that's doing this kind of visualization, analytics, alerting, health monitoring, whether you're an on-prem vendor, um, you've rigged up your own system uh, at an academic institution, or if you're another uh, cloud friend. Um, so the deep need for observability, this is probably something everybody knows about. Um, end users tend to give fairly sparse feedback on what's going wrong. Um, and while Lustre Slats are really useful, they're only available at the command line on box. Um, which is pretty much a no-no for us in the cloud. Um, and so we, we need a lot more than just those stats. We need to monitor networking, CPU loads, memory, disk, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, but basically we have a very broad range of things that we have to track to make sure the systems stay in a healthy state. Um, and so that is basically the need that everyone shares, whether you're on-prem or in the cloud. Um, it's just a nasty issue of scale at the cloud. So uh, within Azure, Managed Luster, um, we've designed all of our, all of the infrastructure we tie into that pre-existed uh, AMLFS, as well as all of the tools that we've built uh, to basically provide this functionality. We've had to make sure that this can scale because we can't dedicate like a single engineer to every cluster that that occurs, especially since some of these are transient. Um, we're basically barred from getting on box, uh, meaning onto the VMs because customer data is directly accessible on those. Uh, so I'm getting on an OSS, um, getting on an MDS, things like this. There's a just-in-time authorization system that you have to have a totally separate laptop that's a really pain, like complete pain in the butt to use. So they make it, um, they force you to design to avoid the situation uh, within Azure, which is a good thing. Um, and you have to make sure that you're exporting in terms of logs, metrics, health information, uh, solely like non-PII, non-sensitive information. Um, we have to be able to like powerfully query through logs um, because you might have not only numerous nodes within a cluster, uh, but you know many clusters that a singular customer might have that we have to look across for shared issues within a even within a specific region. Um, you want to visualize these things to find the exact time uh, where you run into problems. Um, and then you want both alerts that are exposed to the customer as well as ones that are just internal and get an engineer involved before um, a customer is engaged. All of what we've built is uh, basically tied into the monitor data platform, which is something that anybody can build. Uh, you can take your own app or workload, um, tie into Azure Monitor. Um, this was built out of necessity. Basically, anyone building a cloud is going to they're going to run into these kind of telemetry and observability problems really fast. Um, and so effectively, all of Azure at all levels is tied into this and is designed from scale uh, for scale from the bottom up. So we knew if we tied into this, we wouldn't have issues um, making sure that all of our logs, all of our metrics get to someplace sane that we can then work with 
Um, but getting those logs there was, was the first problem. So some of the design criteria we kind of set out uh, to solve around was um, ingesting all the system logs from every single AMLFS side cluster node. So all those different types of nodes. Um, uh, this is all the syslog traffic effectively. We have both, I mean, we use systemd, we're on Ubuntu uh, 2004, but uh, the, the system is really designed for syslog traffic. And so we've made some modifications around that to make sure we're getting everything again, and we don't emit anything PII into syslog. Um, these have to be available to like basically upstream within low digit minutes. Um, nothing sensitive goes in. Um, and then we get access to the powerful querying uh, available through Azure Monitor. So there's a querying language called a Custo querying language um, that it basically relies upon. That's uh, somewhat similar to other QLs. And uh, you can, you can once you've quantized your syslog messages into different components, um, you can search across them for specific programs that might be problematic. Uh, and this is this is paid dividends because when we found one issue with one customer, you can then back out and say, okay, if this is an issue in East US, let's um, let's write a query really quick to see if program X is throwing this specific message across all hundred plus clusters and all many thousands of nodes and see who else might be impacted by this to go go make that fix up. Um, but this this really makes um, you know. It makes maintenance a lot more reasonable, uh, but as somebody that came from like the get the logs and then grep through them, there was a, like a bit of a uptick for me in terms of learning and adapting to this. Uh, but once you do, it's, it's actually amazingly powerful. And finally, there's some non-syslog log ingest that we use for metric-like data um, client exports uh, that Luster gives us that we've also, I don't want to say abused, but potentially abused the logging framework for it. Uh, so the interface that you use to basically get access to this is called dgrep. Um, it supports um, both server-side and client-side queries. So client-side here is the browser. Um, once you get, you know, a typical debugging pattern is you write some server-side that's going to get you a band of time uh, that you can look through the logs for. And then once you get that band of time from a specific cluster, you might not know if the issues with one of the agents, one of the OSSs, et cetera, you can then get it, it's all within the browser in the client side and you can write KQL within the browser as well to look through what might be a couple hundred thousand lines of logs. Um, but this gets really powerful. So there's a bunch of examples of things that I've done in the past to try and um, solve problems uh, for customers or to just look for when I've discovered a bug, see if anybody's um, run into it. Um, but basically like looking through all SSs in a specific region for a, a specific er luster error message. I've even like raised some errors to upstream about this. Like when I've been able to find one in one place, I'm like, I probably can find, maybe that Luster cluster is gone, but I might be able to find another Luster cluster that's still hitting this. Um, so that's been really useful. I'm um, getting all the logs from copy tools uh, in a specific region. If there's some kind of backing storage issue that's plaguing us, um, getting logs for, you know, over a very long time periods, as long as you make the query really narrow on the server side, you can actually go through and find um, look, look for much longer granularities than you might normally be able to. And there's some aggregates that I'll give examples of. <clears throat> so this is, uh, this rendered horribly because I use dark mode, so apologies. Uh, <laughs> might be, might be visible in the, uh, in the PDF, but the important takeaway here is you basically have a server side, uh, left-hand panel, and then all your results are in the right-hand panel, uh, which is basically client side queries at the top. Um, and you can set scoping conditions around the cluster as well as um, then post-process this. So this is just an example of getting a, a search for a cluster over a specific hour that I knew that cluster happened to have a, a problem for. Um, you can use aggregates, which aren't uh, super visible here, but basically there's an additional right-hand panel that can say uh, across the 400,000 lines of logs that I got, um, give, me average, give me counts by program name, for instance. So you could see what's like the especially uh, busy program spewing things, um, spewing things to console, uh, or rather syslog. You can also sum, like this is an interesting one, like summing by severity by event time. So you can look to see when a large number of uh, high severity events have occurred in a specific time to really pinpoint, because you might know the customer complained at this point, but I'd like to actually find when I really got a lot of spew that was at a nasty error level. So let me 
uh, let me sum let me sum severity and then dial in on the exact you know second or or specific minute when a lot of these got emitted. And then finally, metrics via logs. So if anybody's looked at OBD filter stats or um, some of the MDT stats, you get some really great um, client export stats uh, coming out of that. And since we only have access to the cluster side stats, this is like a great way for us to do some performance debugging by uh, taking these, uh, you know, they're, they're emitted on a per client basis, um, but we capture like deltas for these and track mins and maxes across, across time. And since these are on a per client basis, we don't have a great way to make these more generalized metrics because these clients may come and go uh, as, as one does on a non-static um, like Azure managed uh, Lustre cluster. And so we capture these in a log format and then can post-process them. So these are just showing OSSs as clients, but we can post-process some of these uh, and say, okay, that specific client was doing running these kinds of operations um, at this at this time, which was causing your problem, uh, which is a slightly more manual and painful way than I think the job stats. Uh, we don't currently use job stats. That's probably a separate talk. Uh, the metrics design is like basically our second pillar to observability. Um, we use these both for performance analysis prior to getting all the way down to the weeds with the client export stats, um, but also for cluster health triage. Uh, they'll filter into the third pillar of observability, observability I'll talk about later. Um, these, uh, these metrics, you know, our design around these were that we are totally happy to use and reuse a lot of existing uh, utilities, a lot of existing Linux and Lustre stats that we can get access to one box. Uh, we just had to write um, daemons basically to collect these, um, process them in a way that we could then send them into the Azure monitoring framework. Um, these were collected at, you know, they, these get collected at different intervals. Some things only make sense to collect um, once per minute. Some things make sense to collect more frequently than that. Uh, but they are basically um, use a variety of utilities, as mentioned, Elcuddle, Iostat. There's a, there's a ton we rely on. And then since a lot of this is written in Python, uh, we do lean on a bunch of existing Python libraries like PSUtil to gather information about um, the system that we're tracking. There is a similar requirements for time as for logs, so single digit minutes before we need to be able to see this show up in a graph, because again, we're building alerts around this. Um, and then we have two interfaces available for visualizing these metrics, uh, Jarvis and Grafana. Uh, we're moving basically away from Jarvis, which is like an in-house thing to Grafana uh, presently. Um, here are some of the component metrics that we track. Uh, these are all almost all virtualized uh, since we're in Azure, but um, I think there's a lot of probably overlap with what people either um, on-prem vendors are designing their uh, visualization and, and tracking technologies around, as well as what probably people are looking at um, on site that uh, roll your own. Um, but basically some CPU, uh, both on a per core and across the entire system basis, um, available memory, networking, air counts around networking, Disk performance, um, especially some of the more nuanced ones like utilization, uh, merges per second, et cetera. Um, if we see crashes, so both user space and kernel space crashes, um, we, we track these crashes. They go into a specific partition because then they're then um, exfiltrated into a place that we can't, <laughs> we as devs can't get access to because it obviously has sensitive information. We have to write code around getting things out of these. Uh, getting things out of these crashes uh, that will guarantee there's no sense of information trapped in them anymore. Uh, but those go onto specific disk partitions. So we have to track to make sure these aren't getting filled up. And then finally, a data disk capacity. So the normal fullness metrics that you track in Lustre. There's a bunch of Lustre specific stats that we track as well. Um, OSS, MGS, MDS. Uh, some of these are the obvious ones. Um, total requests by type, uh, latencies around these, um, how many clients have been evicted over a period of time, how many clients are currently connected to a given cluster, um, and then some of the less less common ones, uh, maybe that people are tracking like HSM requests, um, how many errors we're seeing over time, number of registered agents. Um, those are all super important to making sure that our connectivity between Blob and Luster remains, uh, remains active and healthy. And then finally, a few... Um, more nuanced ones we've added over time as we've discovered them to be useful, like 
um, the distributed logging timeouts that have been seen over a specific amount of time, change log sizes, et cetera. This is a kind of at a, our, I call it Geneva here. It's interchangeably called Geneva and Jarvis internally. Um, a cluster diagnostics page kind of just showing the OST ops bytes total over time while we were running some benchmarking tests on a test system internally. Um, you can see like over, over a period, it's spiking up and down. So if we're honing in on a specific customer issue and they say, okay, all IO stopped at this time, we can click and drag and, and dial into the exact uh, minute, minute or second that all their IO supposedly stopped. Um, similarly, you can dial into just a given node. So here I've selected OSS uh, 0004 as the problem node. Um, and we're showing like IOSTAT, R08, and uh, W08 to look at latencies for that specific node at, uh, over a period of time. And then finally, some HSM metrics, again, in uh, Geneva, showing completed requests. And this is over a much longer period of time. So we'll track about 30 days back. We're forced to get rid of the logs after that period of time for sensitivity reasons. Um, but basically over a 30 day period, you can, you can look back and arbitrarily manipulate th those metrics to display what you'd like. So this is completed requests. And I've used this specific page a numerous times to figure out when somebody says my restore is not running or my archive is installed for a long period of time. It's great to dial in to exactly what happened at that time and cross reference that to um, attach copy tools. And then finally, the uh, interface, I think someone showed Grafana interface. It seems like everybody's going the Grafana route for visualization. Uh, this is what um, internally, uh, internally and externally, um, Azure monitoring is pushing towards um, the dashboard interface for per node stats. Gives you a whole bunch here. And we've taken all of those luster stats and fed them into uh, some of the mean op latencies at the bottom side of this page, as well as um, some of the ops per second and latency shown um, in a graph format uh, up above. So then finally, um, on our third pillar of observability, we have monitoring and alerts. Um, these are pretty much my favorite, um, but also <laughs> uh, the ones that we've probably tuned the least because they were, we need to get all the way past metrics in order to build alerts based on those metrics. Um, and so, uh, while those first two were awesome, you really need to know that you have a problem to go looking at them. And so building these alerts in a way that isn't waking people up spuriously, uh, but is catching things that our customers care about is something that we keep every time we get an incident, we're going back and saying, what could we, what rule could we build that would catch this? It wouldn't catch a bunch of false positives um, that would allow us to solve this faster. Um, this uses most of the metrics as I mentioned. Uh, we basically the rules are really simple and I'll cover some of them after this. And if others have more interesting rules that you've come up that you've set on your systems, again, I'd, I'd love to trade notes on that. Um, but the once a rule pops, basically emails will be sent, uh, phone calls will be automatically made to engineers. Um, they'll have links pre-populated in the incident report that they can then jump to to get logs, look at metrics, um, or even just jump to the health page that shows exactly when something went into the red. One of the things that's kind of central to this alerting are heartbeats. Um, these are built around OST ping. Um, so in, under proc, there's the, the ping file that you, if you read from, you can, it will either hang uh, if uh, you can't get a hold of that OST or it will give you a response. Um, we, at least currently, we've tuned this a couple of times, um, but we send, I think up to 20 in parallel OST pings. Um, and we give it a 75 second timeout. Uh, we make three attempts, so we sleep for 30 seconds between us. So in case one's immediately not available for some reason, doesn't block on that read, um, we give it a few more tries. And then um, at the end, these are from one MGS. These are basically aggregated and we say, we got, all the, we got a hold of all the OSTs or we didn't get a hold of all the OSTs and which ones didn't, didn't make the cut. Um, if one of them doesn't, it results in a degraded event. Uh, there is, so, so that's great if your MGS is in good connectivity with the uh, monitoring infrastructure, but if it's not, um, then the resource provider, which this thing is basically feeding back information to, um, will also pop an alert if it isn't able to get that degraded or any kind of status from a cluster for a certain period of time. Um, so that's, that's super helpful and basically enables us to 
uh, we've, we've been able to catch all the cases where an OST, uh, basically a VM has gone out to launch or crashed or whatever, uh, usually before a customer reports it to us. Um, and what's really helpful, especially for the 3 a.m. ones, is it will auto mitigate if it comes back online. So if I wake up to one of these calls, <laughs> I can go back to sleep if it's been mitigated and look at it for a root cause in the morning. Uh, all of the following have uh, basically monitors around them and have rules. So if you miss heartbeats or you just didn't get any heartbeats at all, um, sorry, heartbeat indicates a degraded cluster. Those are the two I mentioned already. Um, unexpected reboots, um, capacity is too low on the data disks, um, non-data disk capacity is too low, like OS disks. If core dumps are observed, latencies for various operations um, and memory things. We'll continue to adjust these and add them. But these are these seem like the obvious ones to add up front, and we're going to continue to adjust as we uh, run into run into problems in the field. Or if one of you tells me, "Hey, you should also be looking at this," because we've hit that problem a bunch of times. And so this is the this is still in G the Geneva interface, but basically is a, the health interface. So this is like the first thing. It proceeds in basically opposite order. When an engineer would start looking at this, they'd start at health. They'd get a really rough idea of what rule popped and, and what went wrong. And then they'd work back to metrics if it was performance oriented or if there was something about the metrics that they could, like evictions or something like that, that they could use to dial in a little more. And they go to logs finally. Um, but we developed it in reverse order because we're engineers. Um, so logs are, logs are exciting to us. Um, but basically, this one just shows a, a cluster running dangerously low on data for one specific OSS. Um, it gives you the time at which it went from green to green to orange, and you can see the k bytes available dropping down below the threshold that we've basically specified. Um, and if they happen to delete data, it would come back above the red line and, and clear itself. Uh, and this is a test cluster where um, it was likely deleted as part of our testing infrastructure. Uh, we do a lot of like creations and, and stand up and we're running Auster, we're running some other uh, series of tests for performance, and then it gets deleted. And so these, unfortunately, uh, this is one area where Azure monitoring doesn't, doesn't like some of the transiency of our tests. So I just use it as an example of uh, this is just a degraded, the whole cluster is degraded because all of them have gone completely out to launch um, in the sense of they no longer exist. And so over... Uh, 24 hours, if they get no updates at all from these alerts, it will age out of the, uh, the interface. But um, for our test systems, we have <laughs> many thousands of these clusters that are just there for a given day, and we have to filter that out. But you can specify, thankfully, in the upper left-hand corner, give me uh, health on clusters that are only currently in the degraded state, uh, which is far more useful in the, the production side of the camp than the test side. So wrapping up, um, and I kept this intentionally short because this was not nearly as exciting as or useful to everyone than Andreas is. So hopefully we uh, got some time back. Um, in Azure Managed Luster, we basically had a design for thousands of clusters and you know tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of nodes uh, without having that many engineers. Well, that would be nice. We do not <laughs> do not quite have that many um, logs, logs, metrics, and alerts are our three pillars of observability. Um, I'm kind of walked through some of the interfaces. If people wanted to look at the out of band, any of them in a non-completely resolution screwed format, I would be love, I'd love to walk through them with, with people on test systems that aren't compromising anything. Um, and uh, in most cases, having these three available to us um, have basically enabled us to avoid going on box for uh, almost all the cases, unless we haven't we, we then recognize where we've missed a metric until we know what we need to do to fix it, uh, which has been great because it basically, the less time we're on the box, the less time somebody's going to screw up something at the console um, and the less exposure to customer data that we have. Um, so again, looking for feedback. Uh, I'm glad to take any questions. Hi, uh, Peter from WebCloud. So, um, that, that was very interesting. Thank you. Um, and I understand why the focus is on all the things that go wrong, because I do live in the real world. But um, I wonder if the flip side of that, if at the same time you're, you're able to collate and gather things like the more positive aspects, like um, you know uptime, and then also be able to have metrics over time and look for continuous improvement around those. 
give it on Excel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we do. I think the most recent examples of stuff like that is I was looking at uh, one of our performance engineers. Uh, they were giving me overall numbers from IOR, and then I was going and cross referencing these against like our write our read numbers were awesome, and our write numbers were still okay, but they weren't quite exactly like the network wasn't completely lit up. And so uh, I went to metrics to go look at that. So it's used both for, you know, customer issues, which are, you know, the, the most time sensitive, but also for performance analysis uh, on the engineering side when we're just trying to do normal performance right. debugging. Um, uptime is tricky. We have some customers that are more classic that basically have, they stand up a cluster and it's there forever and they're going to just use it like that. We have other customers that um, do kind of buy in a little more to the, transient cluster model where you're you have all your data in blob you're ingesting it really quickly on stand up you're running a job or a set of jobs usually it's more like project oriented so it's a couple of weeks and then you're tearing down the cluster so i think we we could uh try and do some of the uptime calculations but we'd have to be kind of cautious about did they did this thing go into the red because they deleted the cluster or did this thing go into the red um because you know <laughs> for for like a legitimate right. reason yeah i see you i see the point but uh it still seems like it would be useful in terms of the from the the time it was available how much were you actually able to use it it's like an efficiency thing right oh yeah yeah um we do so we have a concept called sandboxing and that's where we take a subset of these metrics and expose them on the portal for people to look at it um, it's really basic right now. That is one area that we're definitely looking, we're focusing on improving. Um, and we've gotten a bunch of requests. We've shown, we've made po potentially the mistake of showing some customers all these metrics that we collect. And they said, okay, when can I see them? Because I'd like, you know, for HSM in particular, um, that's one that we don't currently export. And so, yeah, we've gotten some some serious requests for adding that to the sandbox. Thank you. Yep. Question back here. Uh, Nathan Daughtry from NVIDIA. So you've got a nice collection of logs and metrics. I think it's pretty extensive. And then at the scale of Azure, you've got a lot of them. Have you considered applying machine learning techniques to mine that for data? Um, anomaly detection, event correlation, or at least even like pre-filtering so that the admins don't have to look at things that have been bucketized as normal and useless. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is a... Uh there is a module called Brain that is uh, a subcomponent of the Azure Monitoring Service that um, we've basically been told we need to onboard to Brain within the next six months um, because it does all the things you just referred to. And there have been a number of services within Azure that have gone through the same process that we have where, you know, you do the logs first because you have to, and then you do the metrics because logs are too painful, and then you do the alerts because, you know, metrics are too painful. And yeah. Uh, as we continue to scale up, um, brain will become invaluable for us. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're definitely, it's, it's been made, we've been made aware that we need to adopt that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, Dee from Oracle. So I'm asking, since you also collect the metrics and syslog from client side, is there any security or authorization oh, it, it, issue? No, we have no access to any of the clients. So, but the metrics you just mentioned is also include the client? The client export stats. So you'll see export stats on any of the server nodes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, the OBD, uh, MDT, there's a couple others that you can get access to export stats, but it's only like raw number of specific commands, a TCP address in our case um, basically did. So how many closes did somebody do? But nothing that would be considered like personally identifiable information. Okay. And also you mentioned like, uh, you only care about total CPU. Is no, that the individual? Yeah, we, we collect, um, the normal things you'll see in top, like, uh, free, busy, IO wait, et cetera, for like an, across all of our CPUs in one of our OSSs, as well as on a per core basis. Oh, okay. yep. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Uh, Kevin Harms, Argon. So you kind of touched on this when you were talking to Peter, but it sounds like, do you provide, so I know that you guys, like Microsoft doesn't look at the client side, but do you provide utilities or their customers interested in doing like performance analysis or improvements 
using that type of infrastructure that you would provide? Like, oh, here's, you can go access this and get client monitoring information. Um, not presently. Yeah, not nothing that I can think of. Um, we have a pretty rich array of client distros that we support or are forced to support in some cases uh, to meet to meet the needs of customers. Um, I would love to pick your brain on what your ideas are there because I don't have I don't have anything presently. I'll usually jump to export stats if I'm really stuck on you know what why are they seeing those specific things but that's a that's a general problem that i think we face being forced to not be connected to those clients in a more formal sense john Prowl and video so to bounce on kevin's question do your tenants run blind when it comes to luster performance for their particular use cases and you have access from Microsoft Azure, the complete monitoring, or do you provide a visualization for them how performant or capacity used or any of these metrics available per the tenant request when they have a luster managed? Yeah, when you say tenant, you're referring to the like the end user and like their client pool. Yeah. So yeah, we run blind. We we can only see those by proxy like through the client export stats or just at an aggregate level um, with the metrics that I shared some of today. Um, yeah, I think, I think there's a deep need for this. I mean, it seems like something that would generally be valuable um, outside of Azure, like across all clouds, probably across everyone using Luster to just look at, hey, I just want to look at things across all my clients. Um, if there's a solution for that, today that would be great <laughs> uh, but i don't have one um so yeah so far i get i get an incident report that says we're too slow and then once i can once i can prove it's not the server side then usually i get roped in on additional calls helping them fix their application uh which i don't know that that problem will ever go away <laughs> 